topic of my sharing for tonight is seeing with the eyes of Jesus. Sister Fausna wrote in her diary, help me, O Lord, that my eyes may be merciful so that I may never suspect or judge from appearances, but look for what is beautiful in my neighbor's souls and come to their rescue. At first glance, it sounds very simple, but in fact, it's a very profound prayer uh, of someone who is very much aware of herself or himself. Eyes are the mirror and reflection of our soul, our heart. They are a means of communication. Sometimes we know that we communicate more with our eyes than with our words. Basically, this is a prayer to have heart transformed into merciful one so that this mercy could be reflected through our gaze. A few thoughts about what, in my opinion, this prayer contains. First, our gaze, our eyes, look, can build up and also can destroy others. We can look at others in the way which will express our kindness, support, appreciation, love, but at the same, the same eyes can ignore, uh, can put down, despise, and even express hatred. Sister Fosna wrote that there is life, but there is also death in the tongue. I think the same we can say about our eyes, about our gaze. There is life, but there is also, it may be also death. The way we see others depends on what is in our heart. And this is the question of tonight. So that, the prayer continues, I may never suspect or judge from appearances our hearts are distorted by the original sin. We all have this inclination, tendency to suspect or ju and judge. Uh, I think we do it very often, if not all the time. This is our broken nature. And Faustina wrote, Oh my Jesus, when shall we look upon souls with higher motives in mind? When will our judgments be true? You give us occasions to practice deeds of mercy, and instead, we use the occasions to pass judgment. And on another, another place, we take the liberty of passing all sorts of judgments, and we repeat them when we would do better to remain silence, silent. Sometimes we even allow ourselves to judge someone's emotions, thoughts, or even um, intentions, which are, after all, known only by God. Why is it so important that Jesus said, stop judging and you will not be judged? Pope Francis wrote, people, whenever they judge, look no further than the surface, whereas the Father looks into the very depths of the soul. To be able to judge, one needs to know the whole truth about the other person. And simply, none of us can say that we know all the truth about others. So our judgment is very dangerous because it can only hurt if not uh, to do something worse. Stop condemning and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven, Jesus teaches us. And the second point. Another thing which is in this prayer is the way I see, I perceive people and things. The way I see, I perceive people and things. Someone said, the world looks in the way my eyes see it. 
The world is such as my eyes see it. Simple test. Two persons are looking at the same thing and both of them sometimes often see it in two or per perceive them in two different ways. The same uh, person or another test when we are looking at someone's behavior as a deed he or she committed, how do we perceive and um, evaluate the same deed committed by our friend and by our enemy? The same thing. To be able to perceive people, things in the right way, good way, one needs to have a clean heart the heart in which God dwells, the heart in the state of grace. This is very important. The heart in the state of grace means after good, honest confession, pure heart. When I look at something, can I truly see? How do I look at it? And what do I see? We don't mean here and promote the attitude of being blind. I don't see, uh, I don't evaluate, I don't care and so on. No, we need to see and we need to evaluate. But the question is how to do it. That is why we are praying to have merciful eyes. Mercy is not about being blind. It's very important. Means, I don't see evil. Or I pretend I don't see. Or being indifferent. You are okay, I am okay. This kind of attitude. Or being naive, childish, or lenient, tolerant. Mercy is not about it. We look at Jesus, who is the best example of the person who never suspects or judges from appearances, but looks for what is beautiful in our souls and comes to our rescue. The Gospel gives us many situations showing what it means to have merciful heart and consistently merciful eyes. I think it would be a good uh, thing to read the Gospels through this perspective, to see how Jesus perceives, looks at people. There are many examples of it, but just a few. Today's Gospel. When Jesus disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity. It's mercy to be moved with pity for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. Or a scene from the house of, of Simon the Pharisee. A sinful woman came, stood behind Jesus at his feet, weeping and bathing his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and anointed them with the ointment. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. But the Pharisee said, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And another, this sort of woman, from St. John's Gospel, chapter 8. Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Moses commanded us to stone such women. And Jesus did not even lift his head. Maybe he didn't want to embarrass her because she was enough embarrassed already. He bent down and wrote on the ground and said to the woman, has no one condemned you? Neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on do not sin anymore. 
and a scene from St. Peter's life. After Peter denied Jesus three times, the word of God says, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. After he denied him three times, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Peter went out and began to weep bitterly. What kind of look was it? Merciful, for sure. And one more scene from the temple. Jesus found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the, as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and said, Take this out of there and stop making my father's house a marketplace. St. John's Gospel. There are many more scenes in the Gospels showing us how Jesus perceived people, how he treated them. This is the best lesson of what it means to look at others with mercy. These situations, scenes, shows us what mercy means in, the, in its core. He is the one who knows the whole truth about us, about our hearts. So he is the one who has the right to, to judge. And he is the judge, the merciful judge. Mercy in its essence exceeds the measure of justice. When God judges, he does so not to condemn, but to look for the good of a person, to help, to rescue. Love and mercy are about truly seeing the goodness of the person. To look for the real goodness of a person ultimately means to seek the eternal good. As John Paul II said in uh, the encyclical Dives in Misericordia, mercy restores to value, promotes and draws good from all the forms of evil. That is why being merciful, having a merciful gaze, does not mean to be always kind, nice, pleasing. Sometimes it requires a very severe reaction to wake up someone, to rescue this person. So that is why I said it's good to look at Jesus from this, to read the gospel from this perspective. He is merciful. All he did was out of mercy. Also in the temple area, the last scene. The goal is not to make people feel good, but to look for their real good, eternal good for their salvation, even if sometimes we will make them feel uncomfortable. Now I wanted to say a few words about the sisterly, brotherly uh, correction, because this is also the aspect of mercy. Of course, we don't like to be corrected and to correct others. Uh, and it's true, it's not easy um, because there is a price for it, always. I would say it's not easy as long as we are self-oriented, self taking care of not to hurt or not to be hurt. Uh, or reject it or experience uh, a form of revenge. We all are weak, but if after praying and honest discernment, I have a clear conviction, I means one has clear conviction, a person, 
that should say something or react about another person's behavior or deed, he or she should do it. Means should correct this other person, regardless her his reaction. Sister Faustina wrote, a religious who does not keep silence will never attain holiness unless it is a spirit of God who is speaking through her, for then she must not keep silence. So a fraternal correction has to be out of love, true desire for what is good for our neighbor, for his, her salvation, after prayer, done in a proper way, in a proper time and place. Jesus said to one of the mystics, that she can correct her neighbors, but only when there is no malevolence or condemnation in her. It needs to be done out of love for them to help them, not because they disturb you. You should have a pure heart, Jesus continued, full of forgiving love, regardless of their behavior and reaction. When I was thinking about this, prayer for merciful eyes, I had a thought that the parable about the prodigal son is a very good illustration of this prayer. The inspiration for me was also the way Henry Nouwen interprets it in his book, The Return of the Prodigal Son. We have here three characters, as we know. The younger rebellious son who asked for a share of his father's estate and left home and came back, the older, resentful son, and the father. The situation takes place when the younger son comes back and his older brother's reaction is exactly suspicion and judgment from appearances. The older brother saw the younger one and he remembered how much his younger brother had taken with him. And now without a word spoken, the entire scenario is ready. Through the glance of, of his eyes, the older brother's eyes, without having an idea about what was truly going on, he became angry, he refused to enter the house, and when the father came out to him, he said, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughtered, you slaughter the, fa the fattened calf. There is a lot to think about, but I would like to pause now and just look at the father's reaction. While he was still a long way off, the gospel says, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Then he ordered his servants, quickly bring the finest rope and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. <clears throat> How beautiful this image of our God is. Look, he is not the one who does not move and expects his children to beg him for forgiveness and promise to do better. He's not like this. He leaves the house, ignoring his dignity by running toward his children paying no heed to apologies and promises of change, and brings them to the table richly prepared for them.
There is one scene, one thing in this scene I would love to see. The very moment when the father and the son approached each other close enough and their eyes met. This one unique moment. Everything, I think, what happened afterwards flowed from this very eyes meeting. We can say that the older brother is the one who doesn't see. The father is the only one who truly sees. Much further than what just his physical eyes could notice. He's looking with the eyes of his heart and he can see the heart. In this situation, he saw the contrite heart of his younger son. Still, he saw both of his sons as good, always in the same way, before and after. By the way, our sins are too little to change God's way of perceiving us, his way of looking at us, his attitude toward us. And we need to have the courage to come back to our Father wherever we are coming from and to let him look straight into our eyes and to look straight into his eyes. No one can do it for us. It's going to be a unique encounter in the history of the world when the Father regains his child as if he was his only child. The Father has been longing for this moment since eternity. And we have been waiting and longing for this moment, for this encounter, for a long time as well. Very often unconsciously. Struggling maybe with self-rejection, self-contempt. There is a deep desire a deep desire in each of us, in every person, for someone who would look at us in this way, with love, accepting us to the end, who would see us as good, in whose eyes we would discover our true value. All of these can only be found in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. In the same eyes which are looking at us through the eyes of his third son who is telling this story, Jesus. In his gaze we can find our home, the place where we are awaited the place where we are loved, safe, where someone is delighted with our presence, where we are the members of the household of God, where we can be ourselves. This home, this gaze is not something outside us. There is no need to look for love far away. It is hidden deep down within us. We carry it in our hearts, where our self is dearly loved. My innermost is a place where the Father is always waiting for me with his highest quality love. We need to make time to adore our God, to contemplate him, to look into his eyes, simply to be with him to let him shape and transform my heart from the lonely, hungry, wounded heart into the heart of his beloved child. Therefore, only when we discover this place, when we find this home in our hearts, 
I mean the personal relationship with our God. Only then we can become a home for others and see what is good in our neighbor's souls and come to their rescue. <laughs>